for tuning in today for this episode of Andoa with Pastor Carol. Uh, my name, you know, it's obvious is uh, Pastor Carol and I'm excited to be today to be continuing with a conversation that we started last time on personality disorders. Now, if you did not get a chance to listen to this video, I urge you to do so because today is a continuation of that conversation that we started the last time. And today what we're going to be doing is expounding a little bit more on what we call personality uh, disorders. Now we discussed last, uh, you know, last time you know, te the 10 main ones, and, but we agreed that whereas we may not qualify to receive this diagnosis, we nevertheless have these tendencies. In fact, we call them blind spots or character flows which when they belong when which when they remain in the unknown zone inevitably cause us pain in relationships and in that session you know we said uh, that opposites attract and today i want to zero in on one combination uh, of those uh, personality traits that is very common one combination of two people with uh, totally opposite personality traits uh, that nevertheless come together. And today I want to discuss a very common one that is you know, quite problematic depending on the extent of the character flow. And today I'm going to be talking about the narcissist and the dependent uh, personality disorders. So for the sake of the people, you know, if you did not listen to the last uh, video, I'm going to describe a little bit, you know, who the narcissist is and also I'm going to describe who the dependent personality uh, person is. Uh, with the uh, narcissist, we had said that this is a person who has an extreme sense of self-importance. You know, they have a great need to be admired. Um, but at the same time, they are quite envious of others. Uh, they lack empathy. In fact, unfortunately, they exploit others to achieve their goals. You know, as I describe them, I'm sure they sound like the baddest of them, right? Um, anyway, this is the kind of person who is initially very charming, but they often use and dump people when they feel that the relationship is not working for them. Now, they genuinely struggle to see the other person's you know, point of view, uh, but they feel that their point of view is superior to their spouses. And because of their inability to be emotional, they get very uncomfortable in intimate situations, earning them the label a love avoidant. So that is the narcissistic uh, personality. They are love avoidance just because they don't really, they feel very uncomfortable when they get into very intimate uh, situations. Now, fortunately or unfortunately, the narcissist or love avoidant falls in love with the person who has the dependent personality uh, disorder tendency. Now, if you recall, this is the person who is characterized by a complete lack of self-confidence. Uh, and by the way, when we talk about self-confidence, we're not saying that they are not high achievers. You can have somebody who is high achiever, you know, a lawyer or a doctor, you know, just this very, you know, very um, uh, uh, advanced uh, uh, careers, but they have a lack of self-confidence. Uh, they have a, an excessive need to be looked after. You know, this is a person who will feel inadequate and helpless about themselves and they will surrender, you know, their personal responsibilities to others who they feel will protect them. Okay, so such a person often will come out as clingy and needy, you know, needing both love and affirmation from their relationships and, and they need that so that they can feel whole, so that they can feel complete. And because of this desperate urge, you know, both to be needed and as well as to be loved, this person is often lab labeled the love addict, the, the love addict. So how does this all work out? Uh, as mentioned earlier, opposites normally attract. And in this case, the dependent love addict and the narcissistic uh, avoidant fall deeply in love with each other. The dependent love addict in a whirlwind of romance receives all the love and attention that the narcissist love avoidance is initially able to give. But after a while, 
the narcissist love avoidant begins to feel suffocated by the relationship and they begin to pull away which becomes very threatening for the dependent love addict and the dependent love addict and the narcissist love avoidant then enter into a vicious cycle of push and pull you know the more their dependent love a uh, love addict pushes you know to get the love you know they are really pushing they really are looking to get the love the more the uh, narcissistic love avoidant pulls away you know uh because they are feeling very suffocated and uh and and and, and this results in a very heated and oftentimes passionate and sometimes even violent confrontations where there is extreme jealousy where there is suspicion accusations in fidelity uh, especially by the dependent love addict and unfortunately the narcissist love avoidant will not only build a wall around them they'll not only build a wall between themselves and their spouse but they might actually begin to look outside of their marriage outside of their relationship to get their needs met either through affairs uh, or through addictions you know such as pornography or alcohol or they may hide behind their work you know they are always busy out there working they may hide behind their charmers if it's a woman or they may hide behind their boys if it is a man and again unfortunately the narcissist love avoidant will also tend to look down on the dependent love addict many times overruling them in their decisions which leaves the love uh, the, the dependent love addict unsure about themselves and uncertain about their own abilities a very crushing a very crushing cycle and a very uh, crushing kind of relationship that leaves especially the, the 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 dependent love addict in a very low position wow now i know i have said a lot but what does the bible say you know about this way of relating and to help us understand this i want us to turn to scripture that we know uh, very well and that is uh, genesis uh, 2 uh, uh, chapter 2 verse 20 to 25 and i'm going to read it uh, for us and this is what it says so the man gave names to all the livestock the birds in the sky and all the wild and all the wild animals but for adam no suitable helper was found so the lord god caused the man to fall into a deep sleep and while he was sleeping he took one of the man's ribs and then closed it up with flesh then the lord god made a woman from the rib that he had taken out of the man and he brought her to the man and the man said this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh she shall be called woman for she was taken out of man and that is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife and they become one flesh now adam and his wife were both naked and they felt no shame now i want us to pay attention uh, to verse 25 and and uh, you know very carefully and this is what it says adam and his wife were both naked and by naked here it means naked the bible is not playing any tricks on us and neither do i want us to spiritualize it but to understand that adam and eve were fully naked i.e they had no clothing no covering they were nude they were bare but naked <laughs> but i do not believe that the bible here is only referring to their nudity but also to a certain vulnerability and incompleteness you know that was there about them but about which they felt no shame. And, and the question is, how was this possible? You know, vulnerability between two spouses, even in the best of marriages, is difficult to achieve. So how did Adam and Eve do it? Now, if you allow me, I want to make a bold suggestion. And I want to state that Adam and Eve had a certain vulnerability about them, a certain insufficiency or incomplete uh, uh, incomplete uh, incompleteness about them and that was a function of design and this was before the fall you see they were created in the image of god but they were not created equal to god if god had created them equal to himself then they too just like god 
would be all knowing, they would be all powerful, and most importantly, they would be self sufficient. Now, what this means is that by virtue of Adam and Eve being created, they needed God or an outside source to complete them. Now, if we're to think about it this way, all the things that we humans create need us to sustain them. Whether it's a car that is created, it needs fuel. Um, it also needs maintenance. If it is software, the software constantly needs to be upgraded. If it is machines, they need to be serviced all the time, all the time to keep them from deteriorating. Uh, same thing with Adam and Eve. There's a nakedness about them that suggested an insufficiency or incompleteness about them that they, that which required God. So, a question, why is it that Adam and Eve, though naked, felt no shame? And what I want to say, suggest is, it's because before the fall, they lived fully in the presence of God, who completely fulfilled their needs and sustained them in a way that made them feel complete. There was something about their relationship with God that made them feel complete. So someone here might say, you know what? I have a successful career. You know, I'm meeting all my financial obligations at home. You know, um, I have my investments. You know, my life is happening. Uh, it's, it's even unexpected. It's working even better than I'd ever hoped for. What is it that only God can meet? And I'm glad you asked that question. Because there are some fundamental needs that are so dear and so close to us. And, I, and these are the ones that I want to share as the ones that God uh, can only meet within us. So the first one I'm going to, 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 discuss, to discuss is the need for love. Every one of us, single, married, rich, poor, have a deep need to be loved unconditionally. Now, this is the kind of love that does not depend on how well or how badly we're doing. It does not depend on whether we have paid our rent or whether we have hit our targets. It does not depend on how much we have messed up or whether we are struggling with addictions or even have a dark past. It is the kind of love that loves us anyway. And this is what the narcissist love avoidant is looking for in their spouse. You know, this is also what the dependent love addict, addict is looking for in their spouse as well. But, you know, how is God different? How is God different? And here's the very, very big thing that I truly want to emphasize today. God loves us, period. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that he excuses our sinfulness, but that he loves us despite ourselves. You see, God is patient with us. God is kind to us. He does not treat us as our, as our sins deserve. In fact, he is long-suffering. In other words, he willingly endures the pain and the suffering that we cause him with the hope that we will, you know, come round to our senses. But this is God. To the love narcissist, love, to the narcissist love avoidant, your spouse is not God. To the dependent love addict, your spouse is not God. They too are broken and dealing with their own issues. They cannot love you the way you want to be loved. Uh, Tim Keller is a, is a, is a theologian, you know, and, and he had this to say. Uh, he said, as society becomes more and more secular, romantic relationships have taken center stage, replacing the worship of God. In other words, we're placing too much energy and emphasis on marriage or relationships to fulfill us. And when these fail, as inevitably they will, then we get deeply disappointed. So what does this mean then for the narcissist love avoidant and for the dependent love, uh, uh, love addict? Simply put, your spouse cannot meet your deepest needs for love. Ouch, but it's true. 
Unfortunately, we live in a world that propagates the myth that marriage is about me. It's supposed to make me happy. And to some extent, yes, a marriage is supposed to, you know, perform, you know, to do that for us. But when we enter into a marriage with a me first mentality, uh, you know, the marriage is to meet my needs, then it puts such a strain on the relationship and each spouse comes out empty. That is what happens when we come looking for that kind of love. The second need that we have is for significance. The need for sig significance has to do with value. Now, both the narcissist and the dependent personality are asking, am I valuable? Am I worthy of attention? Do I matter? The narcissist love avoidance is trying to get their significance by putting down their spouse. The dependent love addict is trying to get their sense of significance from their spouse by trying to please them all the time. Now, again, when it comes to significance, this is something that is ascribed by the creator. You know, for example, when you cook or when you manufacture something or even when you sell your services, you're the one who determines the value of that product or that service. The product or service you're providing cannot self-determine its value. Only you can. Only you know how much you bought the materials for. Only you know how much time it took to create, you know, whatever this thing is. Only you can put that value uh, to that product or that service. And in the same way, as created beings, we cannot determine our value. Only God can. Now, the problem with, you know, the secular world that we live in is that we have moved away from the way, we have moved away from how God values us and sought instead to ascribe value to ourselves. And the problem is that we greatly undervalue ourselves. So to the narcissist uh, love avoidant, you know, your spouse cannot give you the significance that you're looking for. They have no idea what you're worth, but God does. Uh, to the dependent love addict, your spouse cannot give you the significance you're looking for. They have no idea what you're worth, but God, your creator, does. In fact, in Genesis 1.27, it says, so God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created the male and female. He created them. And so when we go back to Adam and Eve, they knew their identity. They knew their DNA. They were not a product of evolution, but rather they had the divine nature in them. You know, out of all the other living creatures, only Adam and Eve had a divine nature. And because of this, they knew they were highly valued by God. You see, you're created in the image of God and are of infinite value to him. You're valued to God even before you do anything, even before you achieve anything. Psalm 8 says, when I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and stars which you have set in place, what is mankind that you're mindful of them? Human beings that, you're, that you care for them. You have made them a little lower than the angels and crowned them with glory and honor. You have made them rulers over the works of your hands. You have put everything under their feet. You see, the Bible says you, you have already been crowned with glory and honor. And God has said this of you. You do not need to compete. You do not need to even demand this from your relationships. You're valuable. You're loved, period. So these then are the basic needs inherent in all of us that only God can fulfill. There are many needs you know, that many try, times we try to get through our relationships, through our marriage, and no matter how long you have been married, it simply does not work. You know, it is folly to try and get our sense of significance and, and purpose, even from work, you know, because what happens when that work goes? People have been known to get into depression and addictions when they have lost their jobs. So our needs for love and significance can only be fulfilled by God. 
Now, as you have listened, you know, you may have recognized that you've been demanding from your spouse only that which God can provide. And, and, and I want to provide you with a few next steps that you can take, you know, to course correct. And the truth is God is for you. You know, he understands that we are naked. He understands that we need him desperately. Even if right now you're feeling discouraged, it is not too late. God knows that we are broken. And the more the brokenness, the greater the miracle for our healing will be. You see, God is not only very willing, but he's also very able to make a difference in your life. So to guide us through the next steps or what to do, I've, I've, I'm going to use the acronym STEP, you know, to make it easier for us to remember. And so I'm going to start with S for stop. Stop demanding from your spouse only what God can give. This is the biggest favor that you can do for yourself. Stop demanding. They too are sinners and they are broken just as you are and they are incapable of giving you what you want. So just stop. Then the next one is T for time. Create time for yourself. Rest, eat right, exercise. It is not too late to change your diet to a healthier one. We, could be at this time of the year and I'm saying it is not too late and uh, do those things that will leave you feeling charged and re-energized you know you can download a workout program on YouTube uh, you know that you can easily do every morning and it will surprise you that a 10 to 15 minute workout is all that it takes to clear your mind and activate you know the feel-good hormones that will make you feel good about yourself and your relationship so take time for yourself E is for emotional connection. Emotionally connect with God. Turn your morning times routine to a time of listening to the Bible or even to worship music. And it will amaze you how God's word is so uplifting. You know, your spouse cannot uplift you in the same way that God's word is going to uplift you. Uh, trying to conjure up feelings of love and peace, you know, by yourself or from the universe or meditation music is a lie and it does not work because you were created to be fulfilled by God. So surrender your life to God, learn to hang out with him and experience God's presence and love for you as you read his word, as you worship, as you pray and, and meditate on him. Now P is for pray. Pray and fast for yourself and for your marriage. Now, fasting is simply humbling yourself before God and coming before him and saying, you know what, I do not have what it takes to mend my, my, my brokenness. Um, I do not have what it takes and I'm calling upon your power, oh God, to help me. Um, now, psychology is helpful, but I'm telling you as a psychologist that psychology also has its limitations. Praying and fasting is important for everyone. Turn to God. And trust him to deliver you from your addictions, from your areas of compromise, from your anger issues, from any indiscipline issues that you have. Or, uh, you, you know, you, may, you might even realize I need to develop some moral convictions, you know. And only God is able. God is able to turn our lives around and to mend those areas that are pain points in our relationships. And what I want to challenge you is watch. Watch and see your deliverance as you humble yourself before God and cry out to him for his help. Now, I'd like us to close in prayer, but before I do so, I'd, I'd, I'd like to encourage those of you who feel that you're in more need of prayer, you know, uh, or in need of talking to a pastor, I'd encourage you to click on the link below and indicate to us that you'd like someone to stand with you in prayer and we're going to, you know, call you and pray for you as pastors. Or it might be that you're not a member of any church and you would like to join a community of people with whom you know you can work with together then I would also encourage you to click on the same link and indicate that you would like to be a part of the Mavuno community so let's pray let's pray and as we do so I want to first of all pray here for someone even as I did last time for someone here who has never given your life to God and as I have been sharing, you recognize that you, that you are not in control of your life and you would like to take, you'd like to ask Jesus to take over, to take over. If this is you, then repeat after me. Dear Jesus, 
I recognize that I am a sinner. I ask you, Jehovah God, that you will forgive my sins. I ask you, Lord, that you would come into my heart. I pray, Lord, that you would write my name in the book of life. I surrender my life to you and invite you to be my Lord and my Savior. Amen. Now, if you have made this prayer, congratulations. You have made the most important decision in your life and you're not going to regret it. Because you see, we are actually not in control of our lives. We need to hand over our life to our creator who knows what is best for us. But I want to tell you that your journey has just begun and you will need guidance in the decision that you have made. And so I'd want to encourage you to indicate to us again on the link there that you've given your life to God and we will put you together with a group of other people who will help you walk in this new life that you have chosen. Now, secondly, I want to pray for people here who also recognize that, yes, you are saved. Uh, and you also recognize, my goodness, the way that I've been running, you know, my, my relationships. Uh, I, you recognize that there's this pattern in your life. You know, you could be the one who is the, uh, the narcissist, you know, who is the love avoidant. Or you recognize that you're the love avoidant. And you're like, oh, my goodness, I recognize that, you know, there's brokenness inside of me. And so if this is you, I'd encourage you to also repeat this prayer after me. Let's pray. Thank you, Jesus, that you're my Lord and my Savior. I come to you seeking for your forgiveness. I recognize my inadequacies. I recognize my sinfulness. I recognize my brokenness. I recognize that I have made poor decisions that have hurt people around me or even decisions that have hurt myself. Father, I come to you and also surrender my life. I first of all just ask for your forgiveness. I, I pray that you would forgive me for the way I've been running my life apart from you. I, I also recognize, Lord, that I do not have the power to change my brokenness, my sinful nature. And therefore, I surrender my sinful nature or sinful heart. And I ask you, oh God, according to Ezekiel 36, 26, 26, that you will remove from me my heart of stone and that you'll give me a heart of flesh and that you'll pour upon me your Holy Spirit and that you'll move me to obey you. Father, I pray, fill me with your Holy Spirit that I may exhibit your nature of love, of joy, of peace, of patience, of kindness, of goodness, of gentleness, and of self-control. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Good job for making that prayer. For those of you who've given your life to God, well done. For those of you who've surrendered your life, you've also surrendered your relationship and come to the understanding that you are powerless without God to do anything uh, about your relationship. Well done as well. I want to say that this is a journey that you've begun of daily surrendering your life to God, of daily surrendering your relationship to God, that he might live through you. And I tell you, I guarantee you that you'll be amazed at the transformation you will see in your life and in your relationships. So that is all that we've had time for this evening. Thank you so much for joining me this evening. I want to say again, we'll see you next week. And until then, God bless you. Amen.